Hello class, I have a asynchronous video where I'll be discussing the chromosomal effects on sexual differentiation. So at the beginning of class we discussed it briefly, but just from the perspective of the SRY gene, it's typically found on the Y chromosome in mammals. But today I'll be talking about other effects that the chromosomes have directly on sexual differentiation. So here I have a picture of the old model, right? Where it's really whether or not you have the SRY or, or not that dictates um, via this sort of long physiological cascade of your ultimate um, sexual differentiation. Um, but we'll see that that's not the case, that it's not just this one gene. And the vast majority of this research is relatively new, about the last 15 years. So this is very much a, a new model. So first, I just want to say that, and, and I've you've probably picked up on this in class, where I've said well, the SRY gene is typically found on the Y chromosome. That doesn't necessarily have to be the case. Uh, the SRY gene can be found on the X chromosome, or maybe missing from the Y chromosome. And so you can go back and probably figure out what the downstream effects of these are. And this occurs be either through recombination between the X and Y chromosome, which is rare, um, but, it, but it can occur. So uh, quite literally the SRY gene can, can jump from the Y chromosome to the X chromosome or kind of get shuttled over as they swap genetic information. Uh, also, the SRY gene can, um, it can mutate on the Y chromosome, and it can render it non-functional. Um, and so it can be functionally lost. And so um, individuals that are XX but have the SRY gene may go their whole life um, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a genetic anatomical, physiological, hormonal, male typical phenotype, but have a have a uh, a female chromosomal phenotype. And and on the other side of the coin, you could have an individual that's uh, that has a male chromosome phenotype, um, but everything else is uh, maybe male typical phenotype because of this SRY gene uh, swapping. Uh, the SRY gene um, that's been discovered relatively recently has non-gonadal effects. So before I kind of talked about the SRY gene, uh, um, codes for this um, testes determining factor, which influences how a bunch of other genes are transcribed. Um, but the SRY gene actually um, uh, codes for that that it's still called the testes determining factor, um, but it acts as a, a, a transcription factor for other genes that don't have anything to do with the development of gonads. Um, so the SRY regulates the transcriptions of genes encoding multiple components of the dopamine machinery, um, including dopamine neurons and the, the substantia nigra nigra, sorry, substantia nigra of the brain. And so um, this green arrow here is a specific pathway um, that is associated with movement and control. All right. This is the substantia nigra. Now, you can maybe pause this and see, or, or ask yourself if, if, I wish I could ask this, any, raise your hand if you know the significance of the dopamine pathway in the substantia nigra. Anybody, anybody? Um, yes, I see that everyone knows it already, but I'll say it anyway. Um, so along these green arrows, this is one part of, of uh, one of the dopamine pathways in the brain. They do wildly different things. But this one is particularly important as dopamine is produced here 
and is shuttled to the substantia nigra, or, or signals are produced here that that get shuttled to the substantia nigra, and it it tells those neurons to produce dopamine. Um, and that neurotransmitter is um, vital for motor function, motor control, balance. There are conditions where neurons in the substantia nigra um, start to die. Um, the reason for this is still um, somewhat unknown. And when this happens, people lose motor function, motor control, balance. This is called Parkinson's disease. Your, your, the neurons in the substantia nigra start to die and you lose dopamine. The common treatments for this are either um, um, taking dopamine or stimulating this part of the midbrain um, or the substantia nigra directly to release lots of dopamine, the cells that are, that are still alive. Um, so the SRY gene is important especially during development uh, for these dopamine neurons. And you can take a look at this graphic here. Uh, these are the different dopamine pathways. Um, as you can see, the nigrostriatal pathway is responsible for movement, um, um, but it's also involved in pleasure and reward, seeking behaviors, addiction, emotion, perception, um, funny enough, people that take um, L-DOPA, if they have Parkinson's, are more susceptible to developing addictions. Um, and then also it fans out throughout the, the cortex, which is sort of the part of the brain that you think about that, um, that, that defines humans from other animals. That's the part of our brain that is really big compared to other animals. Um, so it's involved in cognition, memory, attention, and emotional behavior, and learning. And so it may not be a surprise that we see that males exhibit higher incidences of disorders that are linked to the, the dopamine pathways, such as Parkinson's disease, which I kind of described in detail, um, ADHD, uh, and schizophrenia, which are all, um, they're all disorders that are characterized in some way by some kind of deficiency in or um, like mismediation of of these neurons or of these pathways in some way. So the SRY gene has non-gonadal effects such as development of the dopamine pathways. Um, there are also non-SRY effects of the Y chromosome. SRY gene is not the only important thing uh, on the Y chromosome. So for example, spermatogenesis, which is the development of sperm in the mammal testes. So specifically in rats, um, it fails if you just have the SRY gene. Sperm will not develop if you just have the SRY gene. And we can look at these graphs here. All right. Try not to get bogged down by all the information. But if you look at the second column, XO, so that just means that this individual has an X chromosome and then it doesn't have the Y. But they've added the SRY gene. And this is the amount of of um, spermatogonia that they produce. So this is like a uh, like one of the first developmental stages of producing sperm. They produce very little. And spermatids, which is like the last step before you get to a fully uh, developed um, sperm, they don't produce any. They don't develop that far ahead. Interestingly, um, there are two genes on the X chromosome can be substituted um, and, and if they're upregulated, those individuals will produce 
sperm. They're specifically the SOX9 gene, which we discussed earlier. That's one of the other genes that, one of the big genes that SRY kind of activates through the uh, transcription factor. Um, and then there's this other, this other gene here, EIF2S3X. And that X just means it's on the X chromosome. So you can see here, let's take a look at these individuals here. They have an X chromosome and their Y chromosome has been wiped out. But on the Y chromosome, they've activated the SRY gene and this other EIF gene. And this individual doesn't even have the SRY gene, it has an X chromosome and the SOX9 in this EIF that have been upregulated. And as you can see, dramatically increases these sort of uh, um, these um, early development uh, pre-sperm cells. And there's even, um, especially with this uh, SOX9 individual, SOX9 and EIF gene, no SRY gene anywhere. They're still producing a small amount of spermatids. Uh, so those things that are just one step away from becoming a sperm. Now granted, it is less than your typical XY individual by quite a bit. But in the laboratory, these individuals, um, um, it, 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 about 25% of the individuals with this genetic manipulation to their chromosome produce sperm that were then used in um, assisted re reproduction, i.e. they took the sperm out of those rats, those sperm were able to fertilize an egg. Those eggs develop in utero in a rat came full term and, and, and came out as perfectly normal, healthy rat pups. So at least in the laboratory with a lot of manipulation, um, not that this would necessarily happen in, in nature, um, but nature always finds a way as they say, um, individuals are producing sperm and they don't even have the, they don't have the SRY gene. So pretty, pretty incredible. So there is this, uh, this other phenomenon that happens, this uh, gene that codes for the exist, the X inactive specific transcript. This is a gene that's on the X chromosomes. It's, a, it's what's known as a non-coding gene, which just means it doesn't produce a, ultimately, it doesn't produce a protein. It produces um, uh, an RNA, right? So it, it transcribes, but it doesn't do that last step of translating. And th this isn't uncommon in th in throughout the genome. There are lots of non-coding genes. And so this only gets expressed when you have two X chromosomes, right? It's expressed, and it's only expressed on one. So when you get two X chromosomes together, only one of them typically will start expressing this non-coding RNA gene. And what it does is it, it helps to inactivate that X chromosome that is expressing the, the, the Xist gene. And so this is a little graphic here that kind of shows you the red here are the, the RNA output of that non-coding gene. Um, and it's physically wrapping itself around the X chromosome, which is quite literally what it does in the nucleus. And so it prevents, um, it helps to prevent the DNA in that X chromosome from becoming untangled and getting access to the machinery that you need to transcribe um, genetic information from it. Um, so it's been long viewed that XS um, is a process that reduces sex differences. Um, and we can see in this little graphic down below, um, an XY individual only has one, one X chromosome. And an XX individual has two, but this X is kind of helps to make one of them um, like inoperable, inaccessible to the genetic material. So in a way, 
right? Both of these individuals just have one chromosome that is transcribing, one X chromosome that's transcribing stuff. So in that way, uh, they're more similar, right? Um, but the Xs makes XX and XY cells fundamentally different because the XY doesn't have this non-coding RNA machinery floating around and doing this. It's a very different mechanism unlike anything that's happening in, in a cell that has just XY. Even if they have functionally similar um, expression of just one X chromosome. Um, and also, and like I said, that this is you know quite new stuff, so there's lots of unanswered questions. Um, the excess may have um, um, effects on the autosome, the, the non-sex chromosomes. And so you're producing all this RNA that's binding up one of the X chromosomes. Is that process in of itself or any part of it having an effect on the rest of the autosome? And if it is, that's going to be a complete, that's completely confounded by sex. Because remember, cells with an XY sex, sex chromosome pair, they're not doing that. They're not producing this RNA. Right, so if there are effects outside of the sex chromosome, it's sex specific. Now, with that said, introducing this idea that one of the X chromosomes is typically silenced in XX individuals, um, there is a certain amount of it that escapes inactivation. So you have two X chromosomes, and this has largely been seen as a, a as a protective. Uh, function to prevent sort of a double amplification of genes onto X chromosomes, um, which could have harmful effects. Um, but on average, about 15% of the excess chromosomes escapes inactivation. This is at least in rats and humans. It's about 15%. So of that one X chromosome of the XX pair that has been wrapped up in the excess non-coding RNA um, among other mechanisms that are keeping it silenced, still about 15% of that silenced X chromosome gets transcribed and it gets its, its, get, it gets its genes and its proteins out there. So the, 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 um, the function of these escaping genes, there's a misspelling there, the, the, the function of these genes are largely unknown. Um, but this mechanism likely causes sex differences in phenotypes, because remember, this is not happening in XY cells. Um, and, and we take a look at this graphic here. This is a nice, colorful representation of the silencing of the genes. And so yellow means that there's no transcription happening for these different areas along our chromosome, along the genetic code, and blue um, is expression uh, indicates that these parts are being expressed, which means that the genes um, are being transcribed and being translated and proteins are coming out. Despite the fact that this chromosome has been silenced, it's really only been silenced about 85%. Um, there's also a phenomenon called um, genomic or gene imprinting. This is when something um, in your genome has been um, silenced. And so what I talked about before, the excess, um, that is a form of epigenetic silencing. And so you have, you have something um, whether it be RNA in that case or other types of, of, of uh, proteins or molecules can affect how DNA is transcribed when it's turned on and off and for how long or how short or even if it's completely inaccessible. Um, and so when this happens on a sex chromosome, just by the nature of of sex chromosomes in mammals, it, it gives you a bias. So let's, let me show that to you. First, epigenetics, um, to give you a more um, technical specific 
definition are heritable phenotypic changes that do not involve mutations to DNA. So the code does not change in your nucleic acids, but rather modifications to chemicals that influence the expression of genetic information. So this little graphic here kind of shows you some of the common ones, the more well-known ones. Histones, which are these big uh, proteins that uh, DNA wraps around, and methyl groups, which are little molecules that attach to the nucleic acids themselves and affect how they're transcribed. All right, so these are things that are not DNA, but they influence how DNA um, is expressed, how your genes are coded. And these, um, these molecules and chemicals that are not DNA are heritable. So let's take a look and see if I can convey how uh, just having two different sex chromosomes automatically gives you this sex bias in this phenomena of gene imprinting. Okay, remember gene imprinting means silencing. So if a gene is imprinted, you're kind of turning it off. So when X chromosome genes are imprinted paternally, so that means that there's a gene on the X chromosome that's silenced from the father. They will be disproportionately silenced in XX individuals. So let's take a look at that. So this, this father is passing on its genes. All right, it's got sperm that have, some sperm have a Y chromosome. Other sperm have the X chromosome, all right? Um, so all of this father's sons, just by the nature or, or by the fact that they are sons, means that they got the Y chromosome from their father. So there is no silenced gene. Because if they got the silenced gene, that means they would have gotten the X chromosome, which means they would not be a son, but rather a daughter. Right? They would be an offspring with an XX chromosomal phenotype. And so you can see here, every single XX progeny is going to have that silenced gene. Zero percent of the XY progeny will have that silenced gene. So already we have a sex bias in this gene silencing. It's also biased in the other direction. So if you have an X chromosome gene that is imprinted maternally, so that means that there's a gene that's been silenced on one of the mother's X chromosomes. This will cause a disproportionately silencing in XY individuals because the XY offspring or the sons of this pairing they will get, it, half of them will have this X chromosome with the silenced gene. So half of the sons will have the silenced gene. The other half will have this Y chromosome and this X chromosome without the silenced gene, but half of them will have it. And then for daughters, they're going to get this chromosome without, without the silence gene from the father. And half of them will get the silence chromosome or the non-silence chromosome. Okay, so you might be thinking like, well, wait a minute. If I do the math here, half of the males are going to have the silence gene, right? But also, aren't half of the females, half of the daughters, going to have the silenced gene? Because the other half will have this unsilenced chromosome and this unsilenced cro chromosome. That seems pretty even, right? Half the daughters and half the sons have this silenced chromosome. Yes, but remember what we just talked about with the excess gene. It doesn't stop there. This XY individual 
right here. So half of the sons have the silence gene and 100% of those sons will be expressing that X chromosome, which includes the silence gene. However, daughters that have inherited the silence gene from their mother and the normal X chromosome from their father, because of the actions of the excessed gene, half of their cells will be silencing this entire chromosome just by chance. 50% of the time, this chromosome with the silenced gene will be, will be itself wholly silenced. Whereas the other half of the time, the excess will silence this chromosome. So whereas every cell in this son's body is going to be missing out on the silenced gene, this daughter, only half of the cells in her body are going to be missing out on the silence gene. This is kind of a, a little bit confusing, and I hope that you've been able to follow me through this and seeing how this is the case. Because daughters have two X chromosomes, they're less affected by silence genes from their mother. And because sons only have one X chromosome, they're more greatly affected by silence genes from their mother. So we have a sex bias in the effects of silence genes, regardless of whether the silence gene is on the father or the mother. The bias flips depending on who, whether or not the mother or the father had the silence gene. This has nothing to do with the SRY gene, right? So here's another sex biasing effect of the chromosomes. Um, autosomal effects from a heterochromatic X chromosome. So what does that mean? It's a good question. XX individuals have one X chromosome that is heavily packed in chromatin. Right, so why it's packed in chromatin? Well, first, chromatin um, is your DNA just isn't floating around, you know, all loosey-goosey in the nucleus. It's packed up in these tight little chromosomes, which is mostly protein, right? So remember, we talked about histones. Uh, DNA is wrapped around these histones. These histones itself, with the aid of other proteins, form these coils, and then these coils form coils upon coils. Um, and then there's other scaffolding and proteins involved to form, ultimately, chromatin which is a mixture of protein and DNA that are tightly packed together. The non-coding RNA from the excess gene helps to keep the chromatin together and from unraveling. So where was I going with this? That's a good question. Um, uh, factors that regulate the epigenetic status of the entire genome um, might be limited, might be in limited supply and devote their actions to maintenance of inactivation of the silenced X chromosome and XX cells, rather than to epigenetic regulation of the rest of the genome. Okay, what what is that? That that statement could probably use some clarification, right? So, in XX individuals, the vast majority of the time, as we've learned, one of the X chromosomes has been silenced. It's it's wrapped up in protein. It's wrapped up in this non-coding RNA from the excess gene. It's not allowed, except for that 15% that squeak, squeaks by, isn't allowed to be transcribed. And this is largely a protective effect for XX individuals. Yeah. The excess gene helps to do that. There are other mechanisms in the cell and in the nucleus that helped that help keep this X, this extra X chromosome from unraveling and wreaking havoc by, by doubling the transcription of all the X genes. Okay. So it's been proposed that perhaps, it's been hypothesized that perhaps because the cell has this double X chromosome problem and it's getting some help from the excess gene, but there are other cellular mechanisms that have to devote 
its machinery and its time to making sure this X chromosome stays silent. That those things aren't being used on the rest of the 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 rest of the genome, the other chromosomes, the autosomes. Whereas an XY individual, they don't have this issue with a double chromosome that's exactly the same. Right? They don't have, because of the XY, they don't need all of this extra epigenetic silencing. So the cell machinery and the cell proteins um, that are there, ready to silence chromosomes, they don't need to be called into action for the sex chromosome, so all of their resources are free um, to help mediate epigenetic effects on the rest of the chromosome. So it's hypothesized that perhaps there's a sex bias in how well or the the, the how well cells can mediate epigenetic effects on the autosome itself. XX individuals might be deficient in their ability to do that. So all of these different things that we've talked about, first starting with the SRY or no SRY, which is kind of our original model. But the major points that I've discussed here in this little lecture, Y genes versus no Y genes, right? those genes that are on the Y chromosome that are not the SRY, the excess gene silencing, a number of X chromosomes, dose of X genes and X uh, um, imprinting, and also the epigenetic effects of sex chromosomes on chromatin, which I just discussed. These are all, all five of the, all five of these things um, are sex biased. They are, which means they are different depending on what chromosomes you have, XY or XX. All of these factors likely directly contribute to and interact, which is represented in this little tangle here. So the effects of whether or not you have the SRY or the no SRY probably interacts with these other chromosomal effects as well to ultimately produce sex differences and phenotypes. So just visually, conceptually, we can see that this is quite a bit different than our very simple linear model where nothing is crossing over and nothing's really interacting. So if we put this together with some of those things that we discussed in class today, those, quote, intersex um, conditions that are largely um, downstream effects due to genetic mutations, which alters hormone profiles and developmental stages. We already have a much more complicated model here of interactions, multiple levels of sex phenotypes from chromosome all the way down to secondary sex characteristics and even behavior, which we'll get into in the coming weeks. All right, so this is, this is the old model, and this is sort of just the beginning of the new model. And so, what, like I said, a lot of this stuff is brand new in, in sort of science research terms. You know, stuff that's been known for 10 years, that stuff is brand new. Right. New stuff is coming out all the time. Um, so take some time with this and digest this. Uh, Friday, um, we'll be discussing um, these models and these concepts of, of, of what do we mean by sex as binary? What do we need, mean by sex is on a spectrum? What do we mean by sex is a mosaic? And what, and we'll discuss what we think is the best, um, the least limiting conceptual model for sexual differentiation in animals. And so um, digest this, come to class with questions, because this is likely the most kind of nuanced and complicated um, 
part of the, the mechanism aspect of sexual differentiation. So I want to make sure we have time where we can, we can discuss these things. Okay. Thank you for um, staying with me through this late night, um, dark, dark asynchronous lecture. And I'll see you guys on class, in class on Friday.